Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we are so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. Madeline Levine, PhD, is a psychologist with over 35 years of experience as a clinician, consultant, educator, and author. Her New York Times bestseller, The Price of Privilege, which is a book we recommend so often in our offices, explores the reasons why teenagers from affluent families are experiencing epidemic rates of emotional problems. Her follow-up book, Teach Your Children Well, tackles our current narrow definition of success, how it unnecessarily stresses academically talented kids and marginalizes many more whose talents and interests are less amenable to measurement. Her current book, Ready or Not, focuses on how to best prepare our children and ourselves for an uncertain and rapidly changing world. Grab your journal and pen because you are going to want to be taking notes. Dr. Levine, it is such a privilege to get to spend this time with you. We were just talking before we hit record about how long we have loved and respected your work, how many copies of your books we have recommended to parents and you came through our community here in Nashville years ago and spoke at a local school. And just the wisdom and generosity of your words in that mm-hmm. time was such a picture of who you are as a person as well as as a clinician. And so it is a, a privilege to get to spend time with you today. And speaking of that word, in your book, The Price of Privilege, <laughs> one of the most fascinating facts was about the population of kids who are the most vulnerable in today's world. And will you just start there by talking a little bit about who they are, that population, and what we can do to help? Sure. So I'm not sure that they're the most vulnerable, but they are among the most vulnerable. And so this group of kids with educated parents in good school districts and involved parents are now, according to NIH, an at-risk group. Everything we knew about kids with involved parents and good education and stuff is turning out not to be protective. We were taught in graduate school those are all protective factors. And rates of depression and anxiety disorders, substance abuse, all of those are particularly high among the children of affluent well-educated parents. And what can we do to help? I mean, I think so much of this has to do with rethinking. And in this respect, I think COVID was an opportunity to rethink some of our values, what we emphasize to our children, what we pour our resources in to our children about. And those tend to be accomplishment-oriented things. It's all about performance the last book I wrote called Ready or Not was really an attempt to answer Price of Privilege was written 15 years ago. And I would like to say that it had an impact. People liked the book. You know, originally they've had a, I don't know, 8,000 run on that book because they thought the only people who would read it would be wealthy parents. But it became a very popular book. Frankly, I had hoped that it would really shift things a little. And it has shifted in certain communities a little bit away from performance as being the only measure of a kid's value. But it hasn't shifted radically. There hasn't been a cultural shift in the country away from that. And so the latest book is an attempt to sort of take a look at why not. I mean, if you talk to parents individually, They're all about, yeah, you know, we don't push as much anymore, and we understand that there are a lot of colleges, yet at this point, the kids themselves have internalized this, I'm only as good as my last performance. Yes, You're doing a podcast, I write, I don't want anybody judging me on my last performance. (laughs) You have an editor, right? Right. Yes. Yes. 
And in a lot of school districts, kids' parents have access to their grades on a daily basis. And I keep thinking, you know, if somebody looked at my work or anybody's work unedited and unworked on, it would kind of suck because the first time <laughs> you do something, yes. you're not that good at it. So to have kids internalize that only, you know, straight A's and the best colleges and the most competitive teams are worthwhile while their parents are pulling back, I wanted to know why it's been so hard to shift that. Because mm. everybody agrees. It's not like that, well, now, you know, politically it's become challenging. But most people agree that kids should get a good night's sleep, that they shouldn't be doing four hours of homework a night. And yet the institutions around that have not changed. Mm -hmm. So what we can do to help, I think, is pull back a little bit, rethink what kind of child am I hoping to turn out? And how do you do that? Later, one of your questions is about what parents can do. And I actually think if parents really can inventory their own anxiety mm. and why they're so anxious. Thank you. Thank you. That's so good. <laughs> well, how could you not? I mean, you'd have to be under a rock to not be anxious. Coming out <laughs> of COVID, but, you know, yes. So there are multiple reasons why parents are anxious, but I think we're actually anxious about a lot of the wrong things. Mm. Yes. Well, thinking about your new book, Ready or Not, I know there was a lot of research that went into that book. Is there anything that surprised you from the research? Well, one of the things that surprised me in the research for Price of Privilege had to do with what the group that we thought were protected end up having the highest rates of mental issues and substance abuse issues. Mm. And Ready or Not, what surprised me? I think what surprised me was I didn't go to my usual suspects in Ready or Not, which have always been educators and psychologists. And, you know, I co-founded an educational project down at Stanford about 15 years ago. Those are my go-tos. And I felt like somehow we had missed the boat. So I went to businessmen mm. and I went to the military. I went to people who deal with pressure and uncertainty all the time. Mm. They call it VUCA. We live in a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Wow. And they have some answers for how you deal with uncertainty. And again, I think what surprises me is, oh, well, the military is no longer so hierarchical, right? Because it's not time anymore when you're dealing with the Taliban to go up the whole chain of command. They're gone. So there's more horizontal responsibility. It's one of the ways they deal with how fast things change. So have we changed the structure of schools so that it's easier to respond? Not really. So the surprise, I guess, was, hey, the business world knows a lot about this. The military knows a lot about this. I'm still left with the same question, to be perfectly frank, which is yes. what gets in the way and I have some thoughts about it, but what gets in the way of parents taking the evidence we have? We have evidence-based research. You know, at Stanford, it's like they're big on research there. Right. <laughs> we know what does and doesn't work. And yet on an institutional level, it's been very hard to change. Yes. You know, that's frustrating. Yes. So thank you for doing the work that you do mm. for people who are trying to present in a pleasant and friendly way that there's a whole other way of looking at some of these issues of child development and parenting. Mm. Well, we sure have the same heart and are sure do. wanting to move toward the same things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I have to tell you before I ask you this next question, a great snapshot of where I have so appreciated your voice in that space. I was telling Sissy a little bit earlier that I vividly remember when one of our local schools was the first to screen the documentary Race to Nowhere, which you were a part of. And yeah. I remember midway through that documentary, you were speaking so wisely to the importance of just paying attention to, as you just said, all of child development and what kids have always needed and always will need and some of those basics of sleep. And 
there was B-roll happening during a part of them asking you some questions at this point in the documentary where they were, I think, maybe showing flashcards to six to nine months old, you know, trying to help them learn maybe Mandarin or some other language. And you <laughs> so <laughs> wise. It's my favorite moment in the documentary. You said, you know, what six and nine month olds should be doing is sucking their thumbs and toes. And I remember just cheering in the audience like, yes, we need more wise voices yes. calling us back to these foundational needs for kids that we don't need to be worrying about flashcards with kids who haven't even hit their first birthday. You know, mm. that you just need to be focused on the basics. Absolutely. You know, and you're raising a point that I think about all the time, which is thank you for all your kind words. Basically, mm. I kind of feel like all I did was pay attention. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I've got training, but I paid attention. And yes. It wasn't that hard. You know, Dr. Spock starts off by saying, nobody knows your child as well as you do, and your child should have Band-Aids on them. Really simple, simple stuff. And I'm still left with, well, if it's so simple, like you said, which I think it is, right? A six-month-old, nine-month-old should be sucking on his toes. (laughs) Not learning sign language, not learning Mandarin, just kind of (laughs) learning where his body is or her body is in space. Everybody thinks I'm really writing about children, but in fact, I'd like to think that I'm writing about parents because Mm. child development, I mean, I've been 45 years in this field, (laughs) has not changed. It's not that children run now before they crawl. Child development has not changed. Mm. Parenting has changed. And I think in many ways, it's changed for the worse. It's much more anxious. There was no verb parenting when my children were young, it's become the Olympics of parenting. Mm. The competitiveness is a bad way to approach not just raising a child, but making a family. Mm. I always get asked, what are your tips for parents? (laughs) Or what are your tips about children? But at the end of the day, as we're having this conversation, it is really about what's happened to parents in the last 20 years to make them this anxious, this focused on performance of mm. their children. Yes. That was my soapbox. <laughs> oh, I love that soapbox. I love that Thank soapbox you. <laughs> too. Well, and building on that, because you have been doing this work for all these decades, what would you say are two or three things you think parents need to be offering kids today? I think a really important thing, and it's probably none of them is surprising. One is parents need to listen. 45 years sitting in my office listening to kids, teenagers, young adults. I've never heard a kid say, oh, Dr. Levine, my parents, they just listen too much. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. As long as they talk too much. So Mm -hmm. I think instead of this sort of directive, let me tell you what I think, let me tell you how to handle that, this is what you should do. I think listening is critical. And I think most people are not really good listeners because it feels passive or something to them, especially, you know, well-educated people and high pressure jobs, and they're used to solving problems right away. So it's hard for them to listen. I once did a listening seminar for very highly educated, very wealthy group of people. And I don't think I got through two minutes without being interrupted. (laughs) I'm trying to talk about deep listening and it's like, wait, you, you know, So I'd like parents to listen more. I'd like parents to understand that their child's issues are not theirs to solve. They're their child's to solve. Mm. I think there are very poor consequences for kids whose parents are overly enthusiastic about managing challenge for their children. The third thing, I think parents need to present to their children a really appealing vision of what it means to be an adult Mm. so that it's something you want to do. And that was brought home to me by my youngest son, Jeremy. I have three sons who were all grown and married, but he was playing soccer. So you go to their games, a lot of soccer games, a lot of lacrosse games, and it's kind of boring by the 200th game that you've gone to, right? And you're sitting up there with all the parents and you're, all the parents are reading their phones and like nothing much is happening. And Jeremy must have been about 11. And he comes over to me and he says, you know, Ma, right next door, there's an empty field. Why don't you and your friends go play? And 
that really stuck with me because, I mean, there's a lot of things embedded in that. But one of the things is you see your parents work all week. And then what do they do? They sit on their butts and watch you kick a ball. Like, really? (laughs) I don't think that's an appealing vision. And I think embedded in his go do something instead of sitting here was, you know, make it look a little more interesting to grow up, Mm. which is a big problem because we have a lot of kids who don't want to grow up now and who don't want to drive and who don't want to have relationships and who don't want to share a room with a roommate and who don't want to make compromise. And I think some of that comes from us not assuming our real role as adults and making the kinds of things that adults do, the compromises, the challenges accessible to our children. When I was on, I used to be on the road, you know, like every week. And this is what COVID's good for. That was exhausting being on the road every week. And COVID was a period of time to think about that. During COVID, two grandchildren were born. And so my life changed and I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be on the road some, but not every week. So I'd like people to think about COVID a little bit as an opportunity to rethink, you know, how you live. Mm. Well, I had told you the story about Jeremy and go Mm -hmm. play and making adulthood attractive. And yes, we have all these emerging adulthood programs. Like when you were in school, did you learn about emerging adulthood programs? (laughs) <laughs> no they didn't exist and now i would say the primary referral i make is to an emerging adulthood program either inpatient wow. or outpatient wow and you have to think about like same thing you know adolescent development and young people's development that didn't change very much mm-hmm. how come all these kids need to go like to a hospital to learn how to make their bed or compromise with their roommate yes. so i think teaching the basic skills of life has fallen to the bottom when in fact that's exactly what people need to make it through successfully. Yes. Well, you have already given a lot of amazing answers to this. And I don't know if you have anything additional to think about what you think parents not just need to offer, but they need to be hearing today. And we talk so often about how we've never heard parents feel as much like a failure as they seem to in this day and time. But what do you feel like they need to hear? I think they need to understand that It has been an incredibly challenging time, and we're not done with COVID. What I get in my office are parents who are very worried about the time their kid missed, catching up, their grades. Yeah, you want your kid not to be behind and all that stuff. That is not the task at hand. The task at hand, from my point of view, is making sure that kids are emotionally okay enough to learn. You know, you don't learn when you're depressed or anxious or whatever. And I'm going to use this as an opportunity to clarify something because I don't know in your state, my state, all the statewide numbers came out in the last couple of days showing these deficits. And it's the headline on every paper. The problem with it is it looks like there's been a huge deficit There's not a huge deficit. It wasn't good before, just like mental health wasn't good before. So if now we say 35% of kids have an anxiety disorder or depression, that sounds horrible, one out of three kids. It was one out of three and a half kids before. Mm. Or even in my own school district in Marin, well, not anymore, I've moved to San Francisco, but one of those titles that it puts on the board outside, like with one of the greatest schools. And I was looking at their numbers because every day they've been writing about this tremendous deficit. It's not, it wasn't that great to start with. It's Mm. gone down 1%, but I'm bringing this up because I want to caution your audience around the way things are presented in the media, even the mental health crisis. And I suspect there is a mental health crisis, but there was a mental health crisis before. And then you had people unable to access services. So is it doubled? No, not at all. Is some of this a delay in accessing services? Probably. But I'm very attuned. I started my career writing about the media, not about kids. And I'm just very attuned to 
don't jump to conclusions. And if you can, look at the primary source material, because it often tells a very different story. So I brought that up because I don't think for your audience, who I'm going to make an assumption is for the most part educated because they're listening to a podcast. Right. Right. We know that even under horrendous circumstances, Afghanistan and Vietnam, those things, most soldiers who have PTSD, most soldiers who saw their buddies head blown off, recover. Most do. And I think most people are left with the impression that that's not the case. Most of the kids in your audience will recover from this. And what they need is not pressure around learning. They need, I think, a safe space that pays attention, that knows what they went through. There's no point in talking about these kids as homogenous. Some of them lost a parent. Some of the kids with social phobia were delighted to be home and not have to face a crowd every day. So there's no such thing as what all kids need. But in uh, Ready or Not, I have a story about a young man. He's taking advanced calculus, advanced calculus. And he and his father come to me because he's got trichotillomania, which means he's pulling out his eyebrows and his eyelashes and the hair. Why? The stress in the house around his grades is unbearable. And his father insists on graphing his daily progress, right? Because he lost some time. So he's in advanced calculus. He doesn't need his father graphing anything. And when I say to the father, you're going to have to stop this. Look, you know, and the father says, I'll stop it when he gets into MIT. Wow. And it's like, He's not going to MIT Mm. (laughs) because he has not learned how to control anxiety and you've made it really hard for him. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a call for have kids play, have them have some fun. Yes, you want them to catch up the little bit that they've missed. And not all kids are behind at all. We have an expression in Challenge Success, that's the name of my project, PDF, Playtime, Downtime, Family Time. Mm. every kid and every adult should have some of that built into their day. That's so great. I'd like to see kids in clubs. If I was going to encourage anything, it would probably be that. Get back to being with other kids, get back to negotiating who's running the show. Mm. I always think about tag for some reason, the simplest kid game in the world. It only works if one person is running and one person is trying to catch them, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of collaboration and cooperation that go into the simplest thing that kids do. So from my point of view, rather than an after-school tutor, I'd like to see kids in a club in something that interests them. Yes. Mm. Yes. Great. Dr. Levine, this season of our podcast, we are focusing on raising emotionally strong and worry-free kids. Sissy wrote an amazing book called Raising Worry-Free Girls, and I just released a book called Raising Emotionally Strong Boys, and we're basing it on that content. We'd love to ask you, what is a favorite memory or story from growing up that shaped you into who you are? So it's a question I had a lot of... (laughs) So I had the most difficult. You should, you know, you should <laughs> talk to your people and see where they have difficulty. <laughs> I had difficulty, but it brought back a great memory. And mm. I had an anxious mom and we had very little money. And I was at a Jewish sleepaway camp for two weeks, or maybe 13. And I wanted to learn how to be a lifeguard. I was truly terrified of it because you get thrown in and somebody pretends to be drowning and drags you down. And my mom was like, you've got to be kidding. You know, that sounds awful. (laughs) And it was pretty scary, but it was kind of like, I think I can do this. I really wanted to be a lifeguard. And was I scared when I, I, I was terrified, but I was also like, you're a good swimmer. You can do it. And I think, you know, it was early adolescence. It was one of those first experiences of mom doesn't think I can do this but I think I can, so I'm going to give it a shot. You can never say any characteristic is from one experience, Mm. but I think that experience helped me to see something that's really important, which is if you don't give it a shot, 
you don't get it. And what's the worst that can happen? You know, there was a tap if you were frightened. It's not like somebody was really drowning. Yes. And I think that's been my experience. Mm. I had never written a book. I had never given a talk. I sat in my office and treated kind of depressed moms who were drinking too much. I mean, that was sort of what I was doing and their kids for a long time. But I'm not frightened of taking a risk or trying something new. That's what came to me when I was thinking about Mm -hmm. something that was important. And I think it's something that I've tried to communicate to my kids, which is if you don't give it a shot, it was when I applied for my PhD, you get a million forms you have to fill out. There were no clinical programs around when I was in school. And my husband was like, fill it out. I'm trying to remember who's the soccer player who said, you never make a goal you don't take. Mm. I like that point of view and I like encouraging kids. And I think parents are very anxious and it becomes more difficult to encourage kids when you're anxious. So typically when somebody comes to me, I just, just before this hour, oh, my kid's depressed, this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, let me talk to you. How are you doing? Well, I'm really depressed. (laughs) So so I think we have to check in with ourselves more honestly. Yes. So that the environment in the house is not particularly anxious, is not particularly depressed, Mm. is optimistic and enthusiastic. Mm. And I think we tend to look at our kids. You know, the call is always my kid is amotivational or too motivated and perfectionist or too anxious. I would almost say most of the time. What I find is the work is with the parent. Mm. Not always, but often. Yes. We'd agree. We would certainly agree. David, do you remember trying to get your kids to eat their vitamins when they were little? I sure do. It was not easy. (laughs) Henry keeps his own stash of vitamins at my house, but the only reason he gets excited about them is because they're those candy-like ones. I remember those. Sorry to break it to you, but I'm not sure how much nutrition is actually in those things. I know. That's why I'm so excited about Haya Kids Vitamins. They were formulated with the help of nutritional experts and are pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others. Those vitamins are essential for supporting immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, basically many of the things parents usually bring their kids to us for. (laughs) Yes, it's exciting to think that a little chewable vitamin could help support all these areas of development for kids. And high vitamins are non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. <laughs> and of course, we know kids don't really care about all the health stuff, but Haya's got them covered too. Henry loves the customizable jar that comes with the first order. He had so much fun using the stickers to add his name and fun pictures. We've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To grab this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash RBG The deal is not available on their regular website, so go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash R-B-G and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. What are some things that you think create more courage and resilience in kids? So I think the example I just gave you is an example of what has to happen to develop that. It does not develop every time a parent comes in and says, oh, honey, let me do that for you. I often say every kid in America, this was before the pandemic, knew how to get out of loading the dishwasher. Everyone. Mm -hmm. And they knew all they had to say was, have an AP test tomorrow. I got to go study. (laughs) And then mom who had worked all day long ends up doing the dishes or taking them out of the dishwasher. Mm. I think that to the extent to which parents have some trust that they've raised their kids and that kids themselves are pretty resilient. That word resilience came from work that was done in Hawaii 50, 60 years ago about the fact that some kids just do okay if you don't get in their way too much. And 
while we think we're helping our kids, Mm. I think it works better for me if I give an example of what that looks like in real life. So your nine-year-old's walking home from school and the dog down the block, for whatever reason, starts barking like crazy and she scares your daughter and your daughter comes home and she's teary and shaky, scared of the dog. I don't want to walk past it. I was afraid it was going to hurt me. And that happens all the time, right? Being afraid of dogs or something like that. So I think you have a couple options. One option is to say, man up and too bad, and he won't hurt you. Another option is to say, oh, honey, that must have been terrifying for you. Let's take the car to school tomorrow so you don't have to walk past the dog. Equally bad, right? Right. And the middle of, I'm sure you were scared. I'll walk with you tomorrow. And then I think you can handle it on your own. I'm sure it was scary. If you get scared, take a deep breath. Sort of a little bit of coaching, a little bit of scaffolding, and having faith that your child can tolerate some anxiety. The last talk I gave before COVID hit, it was like two days before COVID. I was at Burke School, big girls' school here in San Francisco, big audience, like 500 people. And I asked how many people in the audience have never had a divorce, a serious illness, a death of a partner or a good friend, a bankruptcy. You know, I went through everything and everybody had had that. I said, how many don't? One woman in the whole audience raised her hand. Wow. And it was like, be careful when you walk to the parking lot, honey, because you have beaten the odds and it will not continue this <laughs> way. <laughs> Oh, man. That experience has stayed on my mind a lot because that's life, right? Mm -hmm. How do you tolerate cancer or bankruptcy or a divorce or any of the things that life will throw at you as you move along in life if you couldn't tolerate a a barking dog? Mm -hmm. So if parents saw that as an opportunity to develop resilience, to develop some courage, I think they would have an easier time tolerating their own anxiety. Look, no mother likes to see their child teary and worried, right? That's a hard thing to tolerate. And we tolerate it better with young children. So I said, I have new grandchildren learning to walk, right? And they take a few steps, they fall on their butt. You know, everybody goes, come on, come on, let's go. And they take a few more steps, come on, let's go. And nobody says, you know, you're going to be flipping burgers at McDonald's if you don't learn how to walk today. (laughs) (laughs) We like the process of falling down and getting up or don't talk to me till you can talk in full sentences, right? When you're, when a baby's babbling. So understanding that you give an opportunity when you step back and just coach a little bit and that you're robbing a child of the opportunity to master some developmentally appropriate anxiety. Let me just underscore that. I'm not talking about, you know, the heroin dealer approaching your child. I'm not talking about your child being bullied, but the kinds of things that are age appropriate, nine-year-olds should be able to tolerate a dog that barks. I had one patient, 15 years old, she didn't like sauce. So nobody could put sauce on her food and parents accommodated it. And then she goes Mm. to college. Remember, food in college, right? Right. (laughs) It was hiding everything. Yes. (laughs) So that's how she got to me. She had to come home from college. So I think if you think of these as robbing your child of really great opportunities to toughen up, to gain some resilience, it's a better way of thinking about it than, you know, it's a short-term gain, a big long-term loss to get in there too often and too much. Yes. Mm. Great way to say that. Yes. What would you say is something, looking back to your own early years of parenting, that you worried about as a parent that you wish you hadn't? I worried about excellence. I didn't worry about grades or anything. It was like I wanted my kids to be really good at whatever they decided they were interested in. And that was a big mistake on a lot of levels. One was the equivalent now would be passion, right? Everybody wants to know about my child has a passion. And right. for a while I was speaking with Dan Pink. I don't know if you know who he is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he's a great guy. And 
we would talk a lot about passion. And then the next day, you know, I'd get a phone call, oh, Dr. Levine, you know, I'm really worried about my kid. He doesn't have a passion. And it's like, how old is your kid? Four. <laughs> 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 so, so I've really changed my point of view about passion and excellence that it takes years and years to develop a passion. You can have an interest and then you pursue it and work on it and it becomes a passion over considerable amount of time and because that was my idea that like I'm great mom I don't care what you're passionate about but you have to really be excellent at something and I have a short story my youngest kid who was a very average student my oldest kid was you know a stellar student my middle kid was in the arts my youngest kid was a b minus student so of course it was always b minus like you know can you just put in a little more work? And, make <laughs> and he was very quiet. And I worried about him because it was a verbal household and he was not verbal. And so I took him when it was time to go to college. Uh, this is vaguely embarrassing, but it's, the story's okay if it helps somebody. Time to go to college. I take him to the local college counselor, not in the school. And I'm in there yakking away, like I'm really worried about Jeremy, like maybe he's depressed because he doesn't work that hard and he doesn't talk. And this isn't bad. She threw me out of the room. It was at a point where I was already known, you know, and she's like, <laughs> get out. And it was the best thing somebody could have done for me mm. because I was weakness based when I was talking about him, not strength based. Wow. Oh. The clinical work teaches you, you better be strength-based if you want to help an adolescent, right? What are you good at? What do you like to do? Not harping on, on what they don't do. And so that young man, who's like 17 at that time, is now one of the directors of communication at City Hall. And if you had told me that in a million years, I wouldn't have believed. This kid didn't talk for 18 years. Wow. And I didn't see what his strength was, which was observational. He knew everything that was going on. And he was quieter. Mm. Understanding that there's a fit in many different ways between you and your child. So I'm verbal. And it's like, hey, come on, let, you know, talk. And that wasn't his strength. And I should have paid more attention to that. So you had to be great at something. I didn't understand that takes a long time. And it may be very different than what you're hoping your child is great at. Yes. He ended up as verbal as can be, but not back in the day. Yes. Another thing that I think is really important is don't see being a parent as a bunch of Instagrams or as a bunch of photographs. Mm -hmm. It is a movie. You know, I have three millennial kids. They're all well into their 30s. The movie is now revealing itself, mm. the kind of people they are, the work they chose, the partners they chose, the friends they have. And whatever I got stuck on, like, oh, you didn't make the select team or, oh, you weren't, you know, I cannot tell you what nonsense it feels like to me now. Yes. And I'm not taking myself out of the group of people because culturally, that's what everybody was doing but it's a mistake for us as parents because it robs us of our own growth i think you go to that game every weekend you're not hanging out with your partner or your best friend or taking a course you've devoted your life to this kind of intensive parenting and i think it makes adulthood look miserable yes and it is miserable for you because you don't get to keep developing mm. So thinking back on your parenting journey, what do you wish somebody had said to you as you started? I wish somebody had said, don't get caught up in any one moment. It's fluid. It's a movie. It changes. Mm -hmm. I can remember my oldest kid went to the Jewish day school and then we moved to the suburbs. We had a great school. And I thought about switching him from the private to the public. And I went and I had him tested and <laughs> the tester said, oh, he'll never be okay in a public school. He is a kid. He needs attention and don't do it. And I did it because with three kids, private school is going to be too expensive. And we had a great school and he was fine. He was perfectly 
fine. He's a lawyer. He went to UCLA. He's got two great kids. He's got a great wife. So at the moment, it felt like the biggest decision I had to make, public school or private school. Just felt like his whole life would be determined by that decision. And it's not. Mm. We sort of lose perspective on the things that really matter. And um, I think it's really important to communicate that perspective to our children about what matters and what doesn't matter. Yes. When you look around you, what do you see other parents struggling with the most? Well, it looks like they're struggling the most with anxiety about their kids. Like the American story is every generation does better than the one before, right? My dad was a cop. I'm a psychologist. That is unlikely to happen going forward for a whole variety of economic reasons. And I think parents have not adjusted to the fact that their kid may not do as well, which of course means financially do as well. And that is only one measure of living successfully is your bank account. And I think while parents look like they're, this is my hesitation, looks like they're really worried about their kids. I think they're really worried about their own standing in the community. All those bumper stickers, my child is an honor student. You know, it really means I'm an honor parent. Thank you. Mm. Um, So, you know, we've lost community. We have absolutely lost a sense of community. And I see the difference in my parenting years. So my oldest son, Lauren, who's 42, when he was in school, The people down the block had a kid in in his grade, and the kid wasn't good in math. And so they said, do you think Lauren could come tutor him a little bit? And it was like, yeah, sure. And he did. But now it's a competition. So my other kid, who's 11 years younger, by that time, it was like, well, why don't you get a tutor? I don't want my kid to tutor your kid, especially if it was on a curve. There's only so many kids who are going to get A's and, Mm. you know, I don't want my kid to lose that position. Mm. So somewhere in that period of time, competition for parents about how they look to the community bubbled up. And that's not historically what a community values. My friend Erskine Bowles from your part of the woods, Mm -hmm. his father taught him that on the way home, you always leave a few logs on the community woodpile. And I love that. It's kind of like, it's not just about you. And somehow it's become so individual. I wish we got back to understanding more about the value of community. You have shared so much truth today. I think we probably all three talk with kids a lot about as emotions are kind of wreaking havoc with them and they're learning to process having truths that they go back to, that they arm themselves with, you know, kind of mantras that they go back to, and parents too. I mean, we all do as human beings. And again, you have shared probably 500 in this conversation. I'd like to write down as mantras. But when you think about your parenting journey, when you think about grandparenting, I mean, even your work with kids and families, what is a truth or a couple of truths that have helped you kind of anchor yourself? Part of the family was lost in the Holocaust. Mm. I worked running groups for the children of the survivors of Holocaust victims. Mm. Wow. It just changes your point of view profoundly. You know, I said to my son, you've got a B minus. I mean, look what's going on in the world in Syria. People live through unbelievable tragedy. I think having the perspective how fortunate we are to live in this time, in this place, as crazy as some of it seems to me, but still to have access to medical care, to have access to education, I am grateful. And along with that goes something that I talk to my kids a lot about. If you walk down the hall upstairs in my house, it's lined with relatives. And I just read a thing online that says, how do you know if you're old? It says, look at your walls and see if you have your relatives on the walls. And that's the <laughs> way that you're old. So, uh, and I didn't like that, but <laughs> I have it because I didn't get here on my own. I just didn't. Mm. And this idea of I'm so special or kids talking about how special they are or not feeling very unspecial. 
we are on the shoulders of the people who came before. And if you're Jewish, you're very aware of that because you've lost so many of the people Mm -hmm. who made it possible for me and my kids to be here. So, you know, we've got Ellis Island in the hall Mm -hmm. with my grandparents because it's not just about you. Back to that thing about you're part of a history, you're part of a community, and you owe something, you know, and people may take issue with that, but I really do believe you owe something back to the community. Your family is your first community. And so when you say, oh, you don't have to wash the dishes or you don't have to clear the table, you're setting up a community where kids think the community's lucky just to have them breathing there and they don't really have to do anything. Oh, that's so So I like chores, no allowance for chores. Nobody gave me an allowance for doing the laundry. My kids didn't get an allowance. Yeah, it's important to be part of a community, and we are. And we tell our kids that we expect them. You know, I'm often asked, well, did you bribe them? And it's like, no, you don't bribe them. That's the expectation is you live here, you're part of this community. Mm. And it is just as important, if not more important, than bringing your GPA up from 322 to 323, you know, Mm. (laughs) which is what kids get if they have that extra 20 minutes of studying. So, yes, yes. We could keep you all day (laughs) in conversation, but we're going to respect your time and simply say again that it has been a joy to spend this time with you Uh, and how rich this conversation's been. And Mm. we like to end with something fun before we hit record. We were laughing together about how much we do indeed love food in the South. We feel very passionate about that, and we're no exception. We like to end with a food-related question. Okay. We love to ask you... Do you prefer queso or guacamole? And then we'd also love to know what's your favorite taco. So that's interesting because I don't think of the South as, you know, as Tex-Mex out here. That's right. Yes, you've got some great Tex-Mex out there. Right. So I thought it would be like fried chicken or (laughs) fried chicken, (laughs) you know. We do love chicken and waffle, shrimp and grits, but on occasion we detour toward Tex-Mex. Right. So definitely guacamole. And I am not a huge taco eater. So it's kind of like, I like your chicken and waffles. I okay, no you can pick that. I want you to know we just had lunch and I had chicken and waffles in my taco. So you can, can go you straight that? there with a taco in Tennessee. <laughs> well, that would be my favorite taco <laughs> that you just named it. Thank you. All right. If you come back to Nashville, we're going to take you for that taco. Yes, All right? we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> Good. We'll, do it. well, we are so delighted to have time with you and just thank you for all the truth that you are pouring into the world. Oh, well, We're thank- so, so grateful. Yes, we are. Thank you. And I would love to come back to Tennessee. Please do. Tennessee would love for you to come back. Yes. And we want to meet you if you come in person. When you come back to Nashville, we're going to take you for that taco. Yeah. And I'm holding you to it. All right. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to click the follow button in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. To learn more about our parenting resources or to see if we're coming to a city near you, visit our website at RaisingBoysAndGirls.com. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.